Venezuela is in the last place in the world for economic uh, freedoms and I'm going to uh, try to explain to you how it happened and more importantly uh, why, it, why it matters, how it got to the stage. So just a, a bit of a kind of history lesson to, uh, to get us up to speed. Venezuela was a Spanish colony, it was kind of a backward of a Spanish empire. Uh, there was no big deposits of gold or silver or, or big populations uh, like the Incas or Axtets who could be enslaved to extract mineral resources. So the Span Spaniards basically left it to itself and it was this kind of quiet, undeveloped uh, piece of jungle and mountains for most of its history. Um, kind of divided up between uh, different caudillos of a strong man who would be ruling different parts of it uh, kind of in a feudal manner. Until, uh, until someone discovered oil in the, in the early 20th century. Uh, very quickly, uh, American companies, American uh, oil men started moving down from Texas, from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and uh, the, the money from, from the oil, the revenues from the oil basically allowed uh, the, uh, you know, the strongest caudillo at the time, Jose Vicente Gomez, to uh, centralize the country and make it into a modern state that we know today. You know, he, he, he had the money with that oil to, uh, to build a strong military, to conquer his competitors, to build the central bureaucracy, to, to basically create a real country out of Venezuela. Um, World War II, you know, a lot of fighting, a lot of distraction happened. Uh, and when it was over, um, everyone wanted to rebuild, everyone wanted to reconstruct, a lot of energy demand, and Venezuela was there to fill up that gap. You know, in the 40s, 50s, it became the biggest export of oil in the world. I mean, that's pretty remarkable now, given its size. Um, it helped find the OPEC. Uh, in, in the 50s, it was uh, already one of the richest countries in the world per capita. Uh, the, another dictator at the time, Perez Jimenez, he used the money to build massive highways, tunnels, buildings, uh, hydropower plants. The tallest building in Latin America until about 10 years ago was actually in Caracas, the capital of Venezuela. Uh, and that was built in the 50s. Just think about it, you know. From the 50s onwards, it was the, the tallest, the most impressive uh, skyline in the entire Latin America. Much bigger cities, much bigger countries, but Venezuela was the richest. Um, yes, as you can see, as you can see sort of here, um, doesn't quite show, but yeah, for most of its history, Venezuelan kind of GDP per capita was way above Latin American average. It was, you know, with some exceptions of small Caribbean islands, it was by far the richest country in South America. Uh, in the 70s, uh, probably a period of history that uh, most of your parents or some of the older people here remember very well, uh, when the uh, Arab countries blocked the supply of oil to Europe and the US in protest over, uh, you know, war with Israel. Who was there again to fill the gap? Venezuela. Massive, massive inflows of, of oil revenue as uh, Venezuela took advantage of the Arab oil embargo in the 70s. Uh, and it was something the country has never seen, the region has never seen. And, uh, the uh, Venezuelans they would flock to Miami to buy up everything they would known as in Miami as uh, give me two, dame dos. You know, it was so cheap for them, but whatever they saw, they just bought two of it at the time at the same time. Uh, and, and the government at the time thought, uh, you know, we have a great Venezuela. It was a project that they came up with, Grand Venezuela. And they thought, we're not just an oil country, we're going to be the, the most developed, rich country in, in the world. And they started building uh, power plants, car production plants, uh, steel mills, aluminum mills. They were just, they were going to become, you know, the next US. Uh, then the uh, oil embargo ended, so yeah, the oil embargo ended, price of oil collapsed, and Venezuela was stuck with all the debt that it gathered in that time. Uh, and, uh, and it just sort of modeled on through the 80s. Uh, uh, standards of living began to gradually decline. Uh, all these industries that was built in the 70s, they were actually pretty uncompetitive. No one really wanted them. No one wanted Venezuelan cars. No one wanted Venezuelan steel. Um, and by the 90s, the country was, um, was, was, uh, was a pretty, in a pretty depressed state, quite, quite vary of corruption, uh, at the same time of slow pace of growth, of rising inequality. Um, 
some people in the, in the, in the, in the government or some, some politicians said, look, you know, we've got to change the way we do things. Uh, we've got to uh, reform our economy. We've got to become a competitive market economy, which means we've got to privatize our company. Um, we got to stop giving out free healthcare and education uh, to everyone, free gasoline. Uh, we got uh, to cut all the red tape and we got to uh, basically go to IMF, take their loan and implement what they tell us to. Uh, most people didn't like that. They want to continue living for free, basically. Uh, free gasoline? Pretty much, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean it, it has become progressively cheap, but right now for one dollar you could cross the entire world in a car if you keep buying gasoline in Venezuela. It's pretty much, it's, it's free. It's free. In fact, uh, <laughs> in fact, the oil company doesn't even bother collecting the money from the pump, from the guys with the pump. It would cost it more money to actually go and collect it than to just let them keep the change. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's a little, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty unbelievable. Um, yeah, people, people didn't want to change where we were living. They, they wanted to, uh, to carry on living, living for free because we were a great oil country, you know? So what's, what's the problem? Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, there was many, many different ways that uh, people tried to disrupt this reform program, attempts to make Venezuela more competitive, basically higher up on that index that uh, Robert was talking about early on. And uh, one of them was Hugo Chavez, who was this uh, captain uh, army captain from a poor, uh, poor background who launched a, a coup against the government that was trying to implement a reform program, killed a bunch of people, uh, said that he didn't achieve his, um, his goal at the time, but he'll do it later. He was put in jail, just spent a couple of years there, then he was out of there at an amnesty. Became extremely popular for the way he was confronting the elites. He said, you know, uh, he's going to clean up a house, he's going to make everyone rich again. Uh, he is going to destroy the elites, he's going to cut down the corruption, you know, pretty, pretty familiar, you know, sounds something similar that we've seen uh, over the last couple of years across the world. Um, he's, and his biggest mentor was Fidel Castro from Cuba, that's the first person he, he went to see on leaving in jail, and when he won the elections in 98, he brought in uh, thousands, literally, of Cuban advisors, doctors, uh, military advisors, uh, sports trainers, etc., to help them um, build Venezuela on the Cuban model, basically. Um, and uh, as he came to power, uh, oil started to rise again. It was when he came to power about ten dollars per barrel. And over his uh, over 2000s, uh, by 2008, it reached 148, I believe, which is a, a, the highest ever to date. Still, the country was just flooded and flooded with, with dollars. Um, 1.5 trillion of oil revenues in the 15 years that he's been in, in power. For a country of just 30 million people, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an insane amount of money. It's, it's like $50,000 per, per person. I mean, what, what, what would you do with 50000 if you, someone just gave you $50,000? Oh, but it was uh, something easy, <laughs> or just... It was, well, no, the oil prices rose, but the, that's the money that was just coming yeah, in. Yeah. It wasn't like he did something that made... Well, we'll, we'll actually get to it. By, by being so crap and running the country, uh, the oil, as we'll see later on, uh, by being so bad, uh, Venezuela oil output actually started falling under him. Uh, because he basically kicked out all the private investors uh, as reserves were rising. So the country actually had more and more oil, but it, it was worse and worse at producing it, which makes prices rise up, right? The, the less uh, oil there is in the market, the higher prices go. So uh, it, was, it was good for Venezuela in the short term because it got high prices, uh, but in the long term, we will we'll, we'll see what happened later. So, so yeah, $50,000 per person. You know, I'm sure a lot of you would have a lot of great plans. Most of Venezuelans, they maybe went to Disneyland a couple of times, bought an imported car, and, and that was it. Most of it was, of course, stolen. Most of it was never, never, never got to Venezuela. Most of it was, was uh, left in corruption. Uh, so, uh, so, yeah, Ch Chavez's you know, vision, it, was, it went even beyond Gran Venezuela, Great Venezuela. He saw himself as the second Bolivar. Bolivar was a, it was a um, liberates Venezuela, the founder of Venezuelan states, and who basically liberated from Spanish the 
about five, six countries, basically the top half of South America, uh, went all the way from Caracas to what is today Bolivia, named, named after him. And he, he was so megalomaniac that he thought like he was as great as, as Bolivar, and he renamed the country the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And of course, if you live in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, you, know, you, uh, you live in the best country in the world. You shouldn't, you shouldn't have to pay for anything at all. So the, that money, instead of being invested in uh, better education, better infrastructure, better healthcare, um, better uh, basically incentives for companies, um, state guarantees, it was just given out. It was, it was just, just given away. And everyone benefited one way or another. I don't understand. People got, get what do you mean checks out? from you the government. A salary from the government for doing nothing? But yeah, that's what I'm, that's what I'm that was about. I was about to tell you that in the next sentence. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the poor people got uh, free foods and house, and basically you just, uh, uh, the food was either uh, ext extremely it's subsidized. Sorry? So it's paid off to be poor? Uh, it paid to be poor in Venezuela, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got free food and, and free housing. Yeah. Does that, is, that, is, is that a clear concept? So, so, the government, yeah, so the government would come to you and say, uh, look, here's free food and here's keys to the house. You just have to keep voting for us. Okay. That's what, yeah. That's a good deal. It's a pretty, yeah, it's a pretty good deal, yeah, when there's money. There's, there's, there's so much oil money flooding around that there was enough for, for basically everyone, yeah? Uh, prices of uh, key, uh, like basically basic foods, basic products, they were uh, kept at very low price. The government was basically paying. Uh, imp subsidizing. subsidizing, yeah. You understand that, that concept, yeah. Uh, so uh, everyone could buy anything they wanted, pretty much. The, the middle class, uh, well, they got uh, basically annual travel allowances. You got about $8,000 a year uh, to travel abroad, basically. You just give your credit card number, and you got uh, $8,000. Just do what, do what you want, you know? That's, that's, that's pretty good. What's that? Exactly, yeah, because, well, the money ran out when the oil prices fell, which we're going to see later on. Um, and the, the rich and the well-connected, they got money uh, through uh, by applying for dollars at the companies they owned. Um, the uh, Chavez's two, uh, his two big policies that basically came back to haunt the country was controlling the prices. So basically all the prices were uh, for, for basic goods, starting from gasoline, like milk, uh, you know, uh, juice, whatever, they were, they were fixed, they were controlled. And the second was currency controls. Uh, when he started going against the private sector, started kicking out investors, started uh, expropriating land, uh, expropriating companies from the uh, previous elites, uh, of course, the, the people started taking money out of the country. You know, I don't want to keep my money there because the government might take it any time. So the government um, put a, a block to any uh, dollars leaving the country. It became impossible to uh, freely uh, buy and, and sell dollars. You just stuck with local currency. Is that the currency controls? Is that, is that a concept that anyone can un understand? Um, and of course, you know, if, you, uh, if you can't get dollars legally, uh, but you need it, you, know, you need access to foreign currency, you know, where, where do you go? Uh, yeah black market. So there was a growing, growing black market. And over time, uh, the distortions just kept, um, the distortion just, just kept uh, rising uh, because the, the official rate was not, uh, uh, was not moving, but people needed more and more money. And what was the, uh, if, you, if you're a company, if you're like any businessman in Venezuela or anyone in Venezuela, and the prices um, are fixed. Uh, so let's say you make, uh, you know, you have a, a milk farm and you make milk and the government tells you, each liter, you can only sell it for 10 shankels. Inflation is 10% uh, a year, so every year, uh, the money you can make on that milk keeps decreasing 10%, right? And eventually it becomes unprofitable for you to, to make milk because you're selling it at a, at a loss. So you stop selling milk, right? Which decreases supply of products in the country, makes inflation rise even, even higher, the whole cycle exaggerate. But the second part of it, in Venezuela, because of currency controls, think, well, I'm a milk farmer. It's, it's not profitable for me to make milk. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to raise any cows. But I'm going to go to the government. I'm going to apply for dollars to, let's say, import a milking machine. Yeah, like, you know, you know, once you 
you put or anything, whatever, or uh, cow feed. Uh, so you apply for those, you get those at the official rate, but you don't actually import anything. Why? Because you know you don't want to make milk, right? It's unprofitable for you to make milk. What you do, you take these dollars and you sell them at the black market for double, triple the price, depend, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and that's how you make money. So by far, yeah, does, does any, every, everyone understand that, that concept? So that became basically changing dollars on the black market or playing the arbitrage, you know, getting, getting, trying to get those at the official rate and then reselling at the black market became by far, by far the most profitable activity. Until recently, uh, now it's a slightly more complicated system, until recently, uh, if you are really well connected, if you basically, you know, president's cousin or something or some, you know, big general, you could get dollars you could get dollars for 10 bolivar rates. So basically each dollar would cost you just 10 bolivars. At the black market, you would get, if you'd go them and someone in the black market, you would get 1.5 million bolivars for each. So think of that percentage. Just think of the margin you can make on that. I mean, that's just the best business proposition in the world. I mean, like not, not oil, not diamonds, not arms could even come close to, to that profit margin, which of course, it, you know, for reason explained, I got no one else was making anything else, uh, which was fine. Um, when the country had a lot of money, when the oil prices were high, you know, you can just, if no one's making anything, we'll just import it, right? And while we're importing it, we can make more money on the corruption, skimming off parts of the imports. So everyone's pretty happy, right? As I explained, you know, the, the poor, they get their cheap food, you know, the, the middle class, they, they travel around Disneyland for, you know, every year, go to Miami, to Madrid, and the rich, they uh, keep basically scamming the dollars through the official exchange rate system. But you know, what, what happens when the, the oil price falls? You no longer have any money to import things. And that's when things start basically going off the rails. Uh, and uh, Chavez, you know, the, that's that army captain who fought himself a second Bolivar, he um, you know, he, he, he didn't really care. He just, uh, you know, he liked to dance and sing with people. Everyone loved him. You know, he traveled around the whole world. He was seen as, you know, we called the 21st century socialism. So it was kind of at the time, at the peak of his power, I mean, like in the mid 2000s, you know, a lot of people in the West thought, you know, he kind of cracked it, you know, so Marxism doesn't quite work, but this guy, he, he kind of, he, he got it. Like, you know, his way of doing things, that's the way he can make it happen, you know? Uh, that's the way to move forward, the, you know, uh, that's the alternative to, uh, to capitalism. Which, of course, it was all tied to high price of oil. Uh, he borrowed uh, massively, he basically mortgaged the country to, to the Chinese who lended him loads and loads of money. He, he was uh, uh, taking out tens of billions of dollars on the international bond market, markets, uh, and then he died, basically. And, uh, you know, it's a, sort of the equivalent of, you know, uh, going to the restaurant, like, you know, the most expensive triple, triple star Michelin restaurant, just having a massive meal, just eating everything you can, and then like running away, basically, not paying the bill. That's what happened. Yeah, he, he died and all the, um, all the problems were uh, relegated to his chosen successor, Nicolas Maduro, who was a bus driver. So all these, all these distortions, all these problems that the uh, economy accumulates around the Chavez and that 15 years of oil fuel binge were left to resolve with a guy who used to drive, who started, whose only job actually was driving a bus for a living. In fact, he didn't do that even very long. He, he was a bus driver for, um, for Caracas's kind of uh, public transport system. But then he thought, I want to get into politics. So he got into a local union and he faked a document saying he's too the bus anymore. So and then he kept collecting the money for driving the bus without actually driving anything. So that's uh, that's the kind of guy. That's the kind of guy he was. And he, once in a while, he still see him on television. You know, he goes around driving buses, and he's really good at it. He's actually yeah, he's really good at driving. Yeah, he, because he could drive with one hand and talk to the camera, and he kind of spin the wheel. And but he's not very good at you know running the country, uh, especially with as many problems as Venezuela had. So pretty much. The red, sorry, that's, that's the, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have explained it earlier, but the red is the reserves, uh, reserves of oil, basically uh, the amount of oil that the country had, or the amount of oil the country could potentially extract. Uh, so this is just to, to show you that uh, 
Venezuela's decline in oil production had nothing to do with its capacity to produce oil. It, it still had a lot of oil. It's not like it just, you know, it's, uh, it, it was running out of it. It had, it, in fact, it has the biggest oil reserves in the world, more than Saudi Arabia. I mean, like, pretty, pretty, pretty tremendous. And it still managed to basically, uh, right now it's producing uh, at the lowest level since the 40s. I mean, that's a pretty remarkable achievement. Um, and uh, yeah, pretty much as soon as Maduro came, M Maduro came to power, uh, oil prices collapsed. So they reached in 2000, uh, 2014, you remember they came as low as $40, $50 per barrel. Uh, all of a sudden the country no longer had any money to, to import all these things. And the whole system, that whole, uh, that whole economic model of uh, free stuff for everyone collapsed and there was no plan B. All it had was just massive, massive amounts of debt. Uh, 2013. 2013. 2013 um, Maduro came to office late 2013, and then the prices started falling first half 2014. So was he, he he was elected. He was elected. Um, remember that Chavez was very popular because basically everything was free under him. You know, so and he said, "Look, you know, this is my chosen successor." Maduro called himself son of Chavez. The, the entire uh, mechanism, uh, the entire state's apparatus was, was under his control. Uh, there was you know, very little opposition left in the country. He, he did win. He did win. And Chavez, Chavez generally was uh, pretty popular. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard not to be popular when you're just basically giving stuff out for free or, you know, to everyone. Uh, you have to be pretty bad at it. Um, so. Um, Oil prices started to fall, Venezuela's income started to fall, and uh, even when oil prices began to recover, we can see that, uh, that orange line in 2016, then things began to improve, Venezuela's oil production just kept falling. Basically, all, over all this time of um, basic squeezing Venezuela's cash cow, the oil company, no one was investing anything into it. Uh, there was massive corruption, everything was taken out of a company, and the country basically can no longer uh, it, it's produce any oil. The, the, the oil industry is destroyed. All the private investors are gone because Chavez kicked them all out. Uh, so when the, the bad times came, there was no way uh, to increase capacity. In fact, we, we can see. Yeah, in fact, that, that decline you see there at the end, uh, this is what happened when, after when Maduro came to power, oil, oil production began to decline. Venezuela lost more uh, in that time, in the last couple of years. In, in fact, in the, in the past year. Venezuela lost more in the past year than Iraq in the year after the US invasion in 2013. I mean, that's uh, 2003, I'm sorry. That's pretty impressive, isn't it? I mean, you know, without a war, without any invasion, without any civil strife, uh, Venezuela managed to basically uh, stop being an oil power just because of mismanagement of, of the economy. Yeah, as I say, again, you know, Venezuela, for most of its history, most of the 20th century, the richest country in Latin America, uh, up to 2014, you know, falling way, way you know, below uh, regional average. And this is a region, I'm sure you don't need to be told, with a lot of really, really poor people. And Venezuela now is way, way poorer even than, excuse me, Bolivia, Peru, countries that uh, until recently were synonymous with, with poverty, really. Yeah, uh, GDP growth collapses as well. Basically, the country hasn't grown since 2013. Uh, the, biggest, uh, the biggest loss of GDP in five years in, in modern history, uh, more than, you know, USSR has lost, uh, after, after it's, well, more than Russia has lost after the collapse of the USSR, more than Cuba has lost in the early 90s. I mean, again, pretty remarkable. But the economy since 2013, since Chavez died, had contracted by half, has lost half. The economy is now just half the size it was five years ago. I mean, this is, the scale of a collapse is really something that we, we haven't seen anywhere in the world for a long, long time. Mm. Uh, like, except for the oil uh, revenues, did the country had any other resources? It's a, it's a, it's a good like question. At the time when things were given free, free was the other uh, factors good? Like, was the economy good there, or was only the oil that kept people? That's, that's, that's a good question. Yeah, as I, as I, as I uh, kind of um, 
as I uh, flicked at early on, there have been attempts uh, before in Venezuela, most notably in the 70s, to diversify economy, to basically uh, take economy, do more things than just oil. Uh, uh, there was steel plants, aluminum plants, um, hydropower, uh, attempt to build uh, heavy industry. It was always kind of half-hearted attempts. It was never particularly good, but yes, there was some industry. When Chavez came to power, there was about 10% of Venezuela exports were non-oil. 10%, about maybe maybe 15. Uh, but there was no, you know, uh, if oil prices are high uh, and you're making loads of money off oil for Chavez, why bother trying to do anything else? You can just you just take that money and you put it in your own pocket, so you give it out to people, so they can keep voting for you. So the little industry that the country had uh, evaporated under the Chavez. It was either expropriated, as I mentioned before, uh, uh, for various uh, political reasons. Uh, you know, it was pretty common. You know, you uh, I suppose the traditional Venezuelan elite, the the, the, the old money in the country, uh, they were the, the enemies of Chavez. So what would Chavez do? He would, uh, you know, you have uh, like a big piece of land. He would just People by bus and say no, it's yours now. And you know, and just they would just come out and and cut all the trees, take down the house, and build their own huts, and that's it. You know, so uh, that was the end of may of that. Maybe it was a productive uh, little agricultural business before, not anymore. And that's what happened to most of the non-oil sector under Chavez. Uh, in fact, uh, Kuwait, which is I was wondering what was the public response to going from like very rich to like a year yeah, I mean, that's, uh, you know, we, I, I try to kind of stick to economics as much as, as possible. I mean, it's, uh, and I'll, I'll get to that part later when we'll talk about migrants and stuff towards the end, but it was, yeah, it's, it's, it's a massive shock, you know, when, when you, uh, one day you are, you know, the richest person in the region and you fly into Miami, the next day you struggling to find enough to eat. I mean, like, you know, just, just try to imagine that. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a, again, the, the scale of collapse of people's, standard of living has been tremendous. Uh, Colombia, uh, which is a neighboring country, a, a bigger and poorer neighbor for most of its history, but that's where, that, that was, basically most of many labor were Colombians in Venezuela. People would clean your house, people would sort of build, build your house, people would clean the streets, they were Colombians. And people in Venezuela really looked down on them. It was kind of like, you know. Now, you know, Colombian borders, Thousands and thousands of Venezuelans, you know, begging to be, get in every day, you know, hundreds of thousands of Venezuelans, you know, tens of thousands of Venezuelan refugees living on Colombian borders trying to get in. And just 15 years ago, we might have had, 10 years ago, five years ago, we might have had Colombian uh, cleaners, you know. So it's, 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 it's really tremendous uh, change of fortune. Yes. Before Chavez was in a regime, like, it was like 1999, do you know, like, What's the economic freedom scale of Venezuela? Like, I wonder if it was in a good shape that Chavez went, or there was like a huge inequality that made him so popular. Of course, of course, they were. Uh, um, it was a nickel country. Uh, it was uh, poverty was rising and inequality was rising. Um, there were a lot of social prog uh, problems. People were obviously not happy. People wanted to change. People wanted things to get better. It was, uh, you know, uh, the country was not going in the right way. But what we voted for ended up being so, so much worse than how it started. Um, that, I mean, some of it may, you may refer to, I might refer to, you know, tomorrow. It's, uh, you know, people that uh, started a rough revolution, hoping it would be much better without the Tsars, and it didn't work out really well either. Uh, so yeah, you gotta be careful what what you wish for. There's where there were people, uh, people there saw the future. They see it coming. They, uh, yeah, they yeah, yeah. I mean, it was uh, as, as um, what I didn't mention. Suppose while Chavez was basically uh, uh, destroying the economy uh, by basically gutting it, uh, uh, gutting the whole productive capacity. At the same time, he was consolidating the political system. So little by little, uh, it was a very, it's a long process. Uh, he, uh, he brought under control all the courts, all the institutions, uh, all um, the entire states. And, and he gradually became more and more oppressive uh, uh, and um, made the system, basically political system, authoritarian. You see, there, there was no, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's Maybe a topic for, for another day. It's just very, very long. With the opposition, and we did a lot of uh, bad mistakes. Uh, they tried to kick out Chavez by, by, by force in 2002, uh, launched a coup against him. In fact, they succeeded, 
they, they kicked him out for three days, but they were so bad, so incompetent, that he came back afterwards. I mean, that's probably the only coup I know in the world where you manage to kick out the leader, and then he comes back three days later, you know? You gotta be pretty bad at launching coups coup, uh, to do that. Um, but yeah, so it was just various, you know, because they, I suppose they, the opposition was most of these old elites who didn't understand the country had changed. And we just wanted to go back to the way things were before, uh, like, uh, you know, the uh, civil war in Russia after, the, after Lenin's revolution, uh, the people that rose up against them, they, they just thought, all we need to do is just go back to how things were before and it will be fine. And no, but, you know, you, you have to adapt some of the people's uh, concerns. You have to change. And, and the, the old elite didn't. Uh, they just wanted to be back in power themselves. So no one really followed them, or not enough people followed them, uh, and Chavez basically became you know, completely it's hard dominant. to find people that follow you when you get free money and free food. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. Um, uh, yeah. So, as I, yeah, as I told you before, Venezuela, uh, a very rich country just until recently. Just from 2014, so this is the year that Maduro took office, the first year without Chavez, uh, half the people uh, live in poverty. This is, the government stopped uh, releasing official statistics, so this is based on, on a survey of all the largest universities that they basically ask people a series of questions about their conditions of life, and, and then they put them um, uh, under poverty line or above poverty line. It's called, they, they measure uh, poverty of uh, income, income poverty, your ability to meet your basic needs. So in 2014, basically half Venezuelans said they couldn't, half Venezuelans couldn't meet their basic needs. Right now it's 87%. I mean, 87% poverty rates in Venezuela just in, just in three years. And it's gotten way, way worse since. Uh, so basically, unless you're in the top level of a government, you are struggling to, to make ends meet. Uh, people, eventually people did want to start doing again something about it. Uh, there was no longer any free stuff to be given out, or not enough of it, so people did rise up. There were two waves of major, major anti-government demonstrations in, in 2014 and last year. Uh, millions of people took to the street for months on end. Some, some cities were completely impassable, people building barricades. Uh, I, was, uh, I was there for both of the times, I was covering them. Uh, uh, as a journalist on the front lines, it was, uh, it was a very, uh, very violent, very difficult process. But in the end, because uh, Maduro still had just enough oil revenue to pay the military to basically keep the soldiers in his pocket, he was able to defeat these, um, these protests. In 2014, there were 43 people that uh, died. In last year, there were 175. 165 dead officially, of course, there was many, many more. Most of them protesters just being shot by, by police and the armed forces. Uh, it did have consequences for the government, so you know, they now under sanctions by most of, <clears throat> by most of uh, world's democracies. Uh, no one is doing business with them, they are increasingly isolated uh, in the international arena. Uh, people are, are leaving increasingly, so basically, you know, if, if all these people that you see at the top picture who wanted to achieve uh, political change peacefully, but all they wanted was just uh, free elections. They just wanted Maduro to call elections uh, because by, by then he became so unpopular, uh, it was impossible for him to, to win any contest, sustain power. Uh, <clears throat> After these protests were defeated, violently suppressed, a lot of people you see in the time picture, they are already gone, they're no longer in the country. Basically, your, your last chance of surviving, making a better life for yourself are gone, you have now left. I'll, I'll come back to it uh, slightly but immigration has, has reached uh, crisis levels. Uh, but also, you know, an, an unfortunate consequence of this process was basically the opposition, the, the, the political parties who finally got their act together um, and who were at the front of these protests, who basically promised people just come out on the streets uh, and, and we'll, we'll make sure the government changes. You know, we, this is your chance to change the, the political regime here. Uh, they were defeated as well. And as of today, there's no real organized opposition in the country because they were completely discredited because of the failure of these protests. You were there while Yeah. Yeah, I was covering both of these protests. Where did you hide? Well, you know, I mean, uh, actually, the, the, the picture at the top, uh, I mean, there's millions of pictures like that, you, you can see, but I chose it. If you see, yeah, if you, if, you, if you see like the building at the top right, I was living maybe like one block away from that. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was very difficult to get out. It was constant tear gas. Uh, it, was, it was pretty tough time. And, and this was going on for months. I mean, this was, 
This was a very, very, I mean, it was, and the protest, they would build barricades from garbage, from debris, so there was rats everywhere, it was like the smell, it, was, it, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, it wasn't fun time. I mean, it hasn't been fun time since, for a long time. Get in and get out from Venezuela? Uh, no, increasingly difficult. Airlines don't really fly there anymore uh, for, obvious reasons. for obvious reasons. Yeah, it was you know the, the whole process is is, is extremely uh, is extremely uh, bureaucratic. The police are really corrupt. You know they can steal your luggage. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 very difficult In, inside the country. There's no more. Um, you can't really fly anymore, you know, again, it's a fi prices are fixed, right? So, so in theory, officially, uh, you know, the government said everything is free, everything is cheap, you know, what are you complaining about? So to fly internally, to fly from like first city to the biggest, to the second city, it's maybe $10. But of course, no one flies there. Why? Because no one can make money, you know, flying for $10. And uh, they don't have any dollars to import spare parts. So you fly in these 70s airplanes with, you know, still like ashtrays, you know, and with like, you know, I think it's called McDouglas. McDouglas, the air company, it doesn't even exist anymore. You know, the, the, the plane maker. It's in, in horrible planes. What's that? McDonald. Yes, thank you very much. Yeah, these are the kind of airline airplanes they had, and even they don't fly anymore. But you can't even go by land either uh, because there's gasoline shortages, because there's constant roadblocks, there's riots, there's police checkpoints endlessly who are just trying to take all your money from you. Uh, uh, there's no spare parts for cars, so it was just everything became extremely difficult, like the most simple things. Uh, so yeah, just go back to inflation, yeah. Um, as I said, people in Minnesota were making less and less because it was unprofitable uh, to make anything, uh, because you can make more money importing things, uh, and uh, because uh, the people who still wanted to make stuff, who wanted to make uh, cardboard boxes or whatever, or, or milk cows, uh, uh, they were being expropriated by the government. So uh, you have fewer and fewer goods um, chasing more and more money. The gov and the government, they didn't have any more oil to uh, back its revenues to. It just started printing money. So when I got here, inflation was 21%. Uh, it's, it's kind of annoying. 21% inflation, it means like every, every year you lose like 20% of your savings. So you just spend everything, you know. But it's okay because there were still things to to buy because it was oil was high, a lot of imports, right? So, uh, you know, and everything was subsidized, uh, like uh, flight tickets. You know, be before there were a lot of airlines flying there, and uh, you know, you could, I could go home to my hometown in Siberia, business class return on Air France for five hundred dollars. You know, I would make, like fly to fly to Europe for a weekend, a couple hundred bucks, business class. You know, because it was set. You know, prices were, were fixed, right? So uh, inflation goes up, prices stay the same, eventually it becomes peanuts. And then airlines left because they can no longer make any money doing that. Uh, and now you can't go anywhere. So yeah, by now it's, uh, inflation is 1.3 million. Um, inflation is so high now, it's, it's more expensive for the government to print money than it's worth. So, so the, 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 piece of, uh, the piece of paper is more expensive when it's nominal worth, and they don't have any money for, for that paper. So there's no cash anymore in the country. Uh, which, so, so the most simple things, uh, I mean, like living in hyperinflation, maybe some of the people who are, again, older than me have, have lived through it before, uh, but it's, it's just the most, it's, it's just the most uh, tiring process, and we're like everything, the most smallest thing become an endless odyssey, like paying for a cup of coffee. Like you say, we just want to have a cup of coffee. You go to a cafe, you have a cup of coffee, how do you pay for it? You have no cash, right? Because there's, you know, there's, no, there's no money to print money. <laughs> um, you have, there's no cash. Um, the, uh, the bank cards um, are not working because uh, banks have no incentives to keep up their payment systems. Uh, and um, because the limits, because inflate, the limits are set by the government. So you're, you have credit cards, credit cards where it was not enough limits to just pay for a cup of coffee. That's, for, that's your mind. Uh, you can do a bank transfer, but there's often uh, power outages, or uh, you know the telecom towers go out of uh, go out of service because it's just, there's no money to maintain uh, you know the power system. So you can't make a bank transfer. So, like, it's you know you can spend an hour trying to pay for a cup of coffee. I mean, increasingly you would just like write a note saying like I owe you for a cup of coffee. I'll pay you back when I can. And people, all right, you know, pay me back where you can. My, my last flight out of Venezuela, my last flight out of Venezuela uh, was, 
on Turkish Airlines, like it was a bit big airline, and uh, I had to like pay some extra or something. I and I, I didn't, I couldn't, I had the money, I couldn't give it to them for all these reasons, and I basically just said, I'll pay you back later, and I said, okay, you know. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. So that's kind of one of one of the uh, one of the unintended consequences of uh, hyperinflation. People had to become much more trusting. But it was just it was a, every, you know. And if it's just a cup of coffee, can you imagine the amount of little things you have to do every day? And everything was like that. Everything took hours or days. Your whole day was just basically figuring out how to get to the next day, so just so you can repeat the next process tomorrow. Uh, uh, it's a very banal existence. Very. So, um, this is uh, you know. Um, how people's lifestyles have changed in Venezuela. So uh, in 2014, um, uh, the, the, the basic foods in Venezuela is corn flour. That is kind of, that is like, that's what you eat every day. You, know? uh, you make these little kind of breads called arepas, and that's what everyone eats. Corn flour is, is, the, is the kind of life, li, li, lifeblood of Venezuelan. Uh, of Venezuelan diets, uh, and by you know 2014, still you know pretty much everyone, almost 100%, 100% uh, uh, of population, was buying corn flour weekly. By 2017, only about 75%, 74% uh, could buy corn flour weekly. Uh, dairy products down to just 20%. Chicken, which is again like a staple of protein, 34%, uh, which means basically a third of population ate protein last year. I mean, that's, it's pretty sad, isn't it? And the third, third, only a third of the population had, a, had access to uh, nutritional, nutritional um, <laughs> diet. That's again from, from the university survey, which is the, the best indicator of uh, lifestyle in Venezuela today. 90% uh, said family income was not enough for them to buy sufficient food. Basically, 90% didn't have money to, to eat as much as they would like. 63%, that's almost two thirds, said they had to skip meals in the last three months because they didn't have enough money. 20% said they don't eat breakfast anymore. I mean, that's certainly, one, one in five Venezuelans no longer eats three times a day. It's, it's really, it's really tragic, really. 64% uh, said they lost weight in the past year. Uh, obesity, again, you know, more, you know, being poor does make you uh, kind of, you know, Skinnier, but um, but you know it's it's uh, it, it's it's sadder than you think. You know, it's you see these people that every day. You know, they just uh, they used to be maybe fats and just like skin sagging everywhere. You know, it's just like the face is drawn. It's it's not an it's not a nice look. You know, and, and you have you meet people that have lost 20, 30 kilograms because you know I remember everything was free. Everything was uh, uh, everything was subsidized. Now you don't have enough money to just buy basics. You know, you see uh, in Caracas there's a lot of um, Mango trees, because just grow everywhere. And before it just was, you know, mango seasons. It would just you just you couldn't walk. You know, it was just mangoes everywhere. Now you see people like fighting on the streets for these mangoes that are falling. Um, I wonder how is their labor market that <coughs> exists? They become farmers because of the food prices. Like, what are they doing most of the day? But nothing works. They do nothing. Yeah, they just sit, collect. Uh, but yeah, but you, well, yeah, you you you, um, you can't fire anyone in Venezuela again. Uh, you know, huh? Well, they, they show up to work, or at least they are technically employed. In you would, you, it's really hard to believe, but in all of that crisis that I've been describing for the last half an hour, unemployment has basically stayed the same. It's about eight percent. It may be risen by like one percent, but you can't fire anyone. You cannot legally fire anyone in Venezuela because of controls. You can't pay them also. You can't pay them also, uh, so a lot of time... Um, you tell them I'll pay you later. You, or, or leave the country. I mean, I've, I've been to factories where workers would... You know, the factory stopped producing things years ago, and workers would just come, would like play dominoes, play cards, like, like maybe like take a hammer, hit something, <laughs> go home, come back the next day, uh, and that's, uh, you know, for years. Yeah, because well, they're what if they're not paid? Well, they, then they go to the government, they complain, and the government sues the company and uh, tries to get money from the owners. Private companies still exist. Yes, they do still exist, but by now they are. You could count them on your fingers, basically. Hmm? 
Yeah, or, 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 or locals or foreign companies who have left. But remember, they're still a legal entity which can be sued, uh, and the government can try to freeze their accounts and you know take the money to pay the workers. What's that? Yeah, yeah, they are phantom companies. Yeah, but you know, and, and uh, if if no one can really pay them, if, if let's say you work in that private factory, it doesn't make anything. The owner ran away. He took all the money with him. There's no way you can get, uh, you know, uh, you you can squeeze more money out of them. The government just takes over factory. So now the government pays you to do nothing. You still do the same thing. You still like play dominoes and like hit something. But now it's the government that picks up the tab for you to do nothing. I mean, in a country where no one makes anything and that has lost half its economy in four years, 8% unemployment is pretty low, you know? It's, it's a lot of people playing dominoes, uh, you know? Why are you done using this film in order to do import or... We well, don't have any money, you don't have any money to import. You need dollars to import. But this factory that has a... They can manufacture anything. Uh, they can if they have... Well, but you don't have inputs, because every, remember, Venezuela never bothered to building a real economy, so you need to import things to make things. Yeah. So let's say to make a cardboard box, you need to import celluloid. Yeah. And you don't have money to import celluloid. Okay. But even if you did, and if you, if you could get dollars, and you make that celluloid, uh, the prices are fixed. So you lose money selling it. So why bother making it? You know, you're not going to make it. Well, that's a subsistence economy. It's basically yeah, a lot of people are basically surviving on what they can plant outside their house. Uh, uh, yes. You know, a lot of people are. Yeah, or as I said, like fighting for mangoes in the streets. Uh, just, yeah, going back to basically medieval ages, you know, you, you make fire with sticks uh, you, because there's no longer any, any gas. Uh, uh, you, uh, you eat what you can grow outside your, your, your garden. Uh, but you walk, there's no longer any public transport really, so you just, you just walk. Um, that's, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it ba it's basically going backwards. Sure. Um, well, maybe, uh, you know, I can, I don't have much, but I'll just finish with the slides and you guys can, we just can do, you know, back and forth, if that's all right. So yeah, just, you know, migration crisis. So in 2018, just this year, 1.5 million Venezuelans are expected to leave the country. That's out of a country of 30 million. So, I mean, just, just think of it. I mean, just think of the scale. According to United Nations, again, like not a, not a uh, kind of free markets, uh, Bastion, according to United, uh, if it's official United Nations statistics, there's more Venezuelan refugees today than Syrian. I mean, that's, that's how bad things are. You know, and that's without war, without invasion, without any epidemic. You managed to create the biggest humanitarian crisis in the world today by scale. I mean, it's, it's, it's an achievement. It really is. Um, most of them, of course, you know, as I said, going to neighboring uh, Colombia, 600,000. Uh, imagine just one year, someone like 600,000 new people come to your country. Uh, it's, it's pretty... Are they well, the, initially they were, because initially they were, the initial waves were educated people, uh, middle class people who, uh, who could leave while they can, so to speak. And they were, and then they went to Miami to become doctors, or, you know, Madrid to work as engineers, and they were accepted, you know, and they, as they, you know, they also, they tended to, uh, there's, there's definitely a, um, a uh, kind of social factor there. The, uh, they look like the rest of the elites in other countries. They were white, they went to the same universities, they were educated, they spoke English. Uh, so they were, yeah, they were accepted. By now, the, the, the kind of people that are leaving are people with no skills, with basically no educations, and they're just, just leaving in an, an attempt to survive by any means. You know, just, just survival is all they want. They don't want the social status or a good job or, you know. So by now, there's a lot of tensions because uh, you have uh, refugee camps uh, full of people that will, no, never, will, will never be integrated into an economy realistically. Um, so all of a sudden, it's, 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 this is the biggest issue in Latin America right now, or South America, better said, uh, how do you deal with that massive influx of, of uh, Venezuelans in Chile? I mean, you had a speaker about it before. When I first went to Chile in 2005, I mean, it was barely like, I mean, there was no black people. Like, if you see a black person in the street, you know, you would take a photo. You know, it's just not. Now, uh, you know, is the uh, some of the Haitians, but you know, uh, the amount of it's just it's a cultural shock in the country for them to see all the black people coming from Venezuela uh, in very destitute situations and living in the streets. And it's for a country that's not used to immigration. 
it's, it's a big shock. But of course, the biggest shock is for Venezuelans themselves. Um, so, so this is the, the diaspora. This is Venezuelan dia diaspora is, uh, I'm sure, I mean, this, this isn't a room where you should, you should have to describe what diaspora is. Uh, but the, uh, the point is that uh, Venezuela was a rich country. There was no, no Venezuelans were living abroad. Why would you live abroad if you had a great climate, you know, everything was free, uh, you know, uh, you had the Caribbean beaches, you know, you, like, every, you know, beautiful women, everything was great. Why would you possibly want to leave? So, um, up until, so if, up until 2012, starting there, uh, all Venezuelans were living in Venezuela. This means that the zero here means that uh, it's not quite zero. It's, it's, it's maybe like 0 0.2 or something. It means all Venezuelans that exist in the world are in Venezuela right now. Um, by 80% uh, of people who, 80% of Venezuelans who live outside Venezuela, anywhere in the world, who are alive today, have left in the last two years. So Venezuela uh, went from being basically um, a, a net receipt of, of immigrants, a country that everyone lived inside because it was a great place to live, uh, to having a massive diaspora all over the world, uh, some of it in really destitute situation in just two years. In just two years, I mean, it's nothing, really. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, a, really, um, it's a really big shock. Uh, yeah, just to, just to finish off about immigration, up until the 80s, uh, Venezuela was attracting immigrants from Spain, from Italy, from Portugal. It was richer than Southern Europe. I mean, there was, this is, you know, you, when you would go to Venezuela, there was Italian restaurants everywhere and Spanish bars. All the restaurants are owned by Portuguese. Uh, it, it's a country, you know, built by, by European labor because it was a, uh, it was a, uh, a really rich country. Uh, and uh, it was, uh, you know, you'd go to, a Venezuelan would go to Spain, would be like, wow, you're from Venezuela, you know? Uh, now it's, uh, they are leaving themselves, um, so it's uh, really uh, you know the, the, the biggest the biggest social collapse in modern history, all because someone just wanted to fix prices and control currency and didn't know when to stop, basically. So that's it. Yeah. So. I want to ask maybe two questions. I think maybe the first one is more a little bit more important. If you can explain a little bit. What do you think created the, the crisis? If it's more economic or more political, and where does it cross between? Where does it cross between them? And the second question is: I understand the situation now in, in Venezuela is like because New York City is big; no one has anything to eat. But there is a the country is still running. It's not like Syria; there everything almost collapsed. <laughs> I understand China is a big thing, a big part of it. If you can explain more about what's going on from that perspective. So China, you mentioned China. Yeah. Yeah. In the end. Uh, the, the crisis is, is entirely economic, and so it's completely avoidable. You know, there's, again, there's no, there's no war, there's no uh, epidemic, no invasion, there's no, there's no need absolutely for this to end up like that. Uh, and even countries that have uh, tried to implement similar systems, same kind of 21st century socialism kind of stuff, uh, like, for example, uh, Evo Morales in Bolivia, another really, what used to be a really poor country, or Rafael Correa until recently in Ecuador. You know, they, they had their ups and downs, but it's, it's there, it's holding up, you know, it's okay. You know, what happened in Venezuela is completely unprecedented, and it's all, it's all due to mismanagement of resources. So, like, resources. So if you're saying these other countries are running similar models, what's the difference? Uh, basic fiscal discipline. In, in Bolivia, they use the money they got, and they don't have oil, not a lot of oil, they have natural, pretty much the same thing for these purposes. They, uh, uh, when the prices were high, uh, they would spend some of it uh, on poor people, on make, you know, making new roads, some of it they would save. So when the prices go down, uh, they have some cushion to go back to. It's the most basic you know, management of state resources, so, you know, really, really basic. Well, Venezuela, spend, 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 spend. When the money run out, when the oil price is down, you don't have, all you have is debts. You don't have any, anything to go back to. That's, that's the difference, is, is, uh, is managing uh, your budget, looking ahead, and instead of just stealing everything or handing it out to your to your friends uh, and supporters, uh, you try to look ahead and um, and plan. And they didn't. And in Bolivia, there's no noticeable price control. So you allow, you give uh, private sector some incentives to carry on making things and selling them. 
There's, of course, problems. You know, uh, it's, it's not a particularly nice place to do business, but it does exist. You, 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 you can make things and sell things in Bolivia. While in Venezuela, because of currency controls, uh, sorry, uh, price control and inflation, the private sector and expropriations, the private sector has disappeared. That's the difference. Uh, you know, politics. I mean, the uh, the political crisis was caused more by by economics. You know, o overall, overall, with some exceptions, majority of Venezuelans were pretty happy to let things run as they do. Uh, Chavez, gen he won, I don't know how many, like 17 elections or something. Not just him, but his party, etc. Yeah, like 16, 17 elections. He he, he generally won. You know, he won. Um, when people started voting against them, it was when things already, when the economy already collapsed. You know, when by that time it was too late because the government was too entrenched and it's not going to leave. It, it's, uh, it realized it stole so much money, but as soon as it leaves power, they'll all end up in jail. So there's no, they stay in there till the end until someone takes them out by force. Uh, China was, uh, just, just to finish up, China, China yeah, was the, the biggest backer, the financial backer of, uh, of Chavez. Uh, Chinese needed the energy supplies, they invested heavily. We gave about $60 billion uh, worth of loans to Venezuela, just in comparison. That's, that's more in real terms. That's even controlling for inflation, for real value, that's more than the size of a uh, Marshall Plan to Europe after, after World War II. I mean, that's, that's the amount of support China has given to Venezuela. Um, and uh, by now, it has stopped. We realize it's a bottomless hole, that we're not getting their money back, that uh, it's just thrown good money after bad. We're still there. We're not publicly criticizing them, but we're no, we, we, we no longer investing new money. So that's that's also the income which has which has helped Chavez uh, a lot stay in power is is now is now finished. Uh, yeah. How, how does Maduro pay his army? That's that's what my How does he pay his army? Well, we still uh, you know the, the first slides I made. There's still some oil being exported. Obviously, it, it keeps falling tremendously every month. Uh, but it's not zero yet. It still exports about eight. 100,000 a million barrels a day. That's, that's, that's a lot of oil still, you know, it's still a lot of oil. Uh, and pretty much all of it goes to, to the military. The military now controls everything in the country. But Maduro's, the, way, the reason he was able to survive these protests, as I alluded to earlier, is, is keeping military on the side and that man giving them the entire economy. So basically, the military, you guys run everything in the economy, you continue stealing everything, and like, and I do the politics. You know, you don't handle the politics, I keep running the country, and you have the economy. So the oil company, it's, it's nationalized, so the state oil company, it's run by the generals. All food imports, which is the biggest source of corruption because for every bag of milk you import, you take 50% for yourself. That's all run by the military. Uh, mining, all by the military. Uh, official dollar uh, sort of allocation mechanism by the military. So basically, all, uh, ways for you to make money in Venezuela are in, in hands of uh, generals. That's the reason why we still support it. Yeah. I assess that we're not going to see any referendum in the next few years. Because, mm -hmm. okay. And uh, I know that it might uh, seem like I'm looking for obvious answer, but we have two cases. One first case is the government going to stay the same. Mm -hmm. The second case is going to change. Okay. In your opinion, it's, I think it's not going to change. Okay, what's going to, be, what's going to happen in the next few years? Like, I think if this was planet Earth, we were going like we were suicide. Okay. Yeah. So, well, that's it's, it's a big question. Um, you know, the the opposition or better said, the opponents of of the government have tried pretty much everything in the last few years. Uh, they have tried winning elections. They won the election. Uh, they basically got control over Congress over Knesset. What did Maduro do? Uh, he created. A parallel Congress, like a second Congress, and I would say, well, this is the real Congress. You guys are not a real Congress, so you know, uh, so yeah. So there's no more Congress. So they tried the elections, didn't work. They tried the process, didn't work. They tried the international pressure. So they got the U.S., European Union to impose sanctions of all the top officials uh, to impose economic sanctions, didn't work. Just, Why just. Like, they tried exactly. Them. Yeah, they, they tried it. So not, not, nothing, nothing works. So unfortunately, pretty much. Everyone in Venezuela no longer believes that there's a peaceful way out of this, that there's, the government is not going anywhere, and the only way it could change is through violence. Every external invasion, Trump sometimes talks about it, although by now it's mostly, blah, well, it's all blah, blah, but it doesn't seem like we're doing any real preparations. So it's, it seems like it's pretty serious. Like it's, it's 
because yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a, it's in a country that didn't really have a war since independence since. 1850s. This is this is not this is not the Middle East where you know there's a lot of wars. Uh, this is these are people that have never really. But there's no history of civil strife, and and for it to get to the stage where now it's, you see some parallels with Syria. I mean, this was just if, some, if someone would said what you told me like two years ago, everyone would laugh. It would just be so crazy. Now now it's it seems like a really uh, poss real possibility. Uh, yeah, it's really scary. Mm. Uh, yeah. uh, what do you think about petroleum, or and have you seen like uh, alternative currency systems that are trying to, to participate and to P -p petroleum? Yeah. You mean petro, the uh, the okay. cryptocurrency? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You know, inflation, as I said, a million percent. Your currency is worthless. What do you do? You try to create like another currency. You know, this one didn't work out. We'll do something else. But uh, but you need. Uh, what do you need for? Uh, a cur any currency to work anyway, it doesn't matter if it's crypto or anything or a piece of metal. Uh, it. Yeah, you need people to believe it. And who's, no one believes Maduro, uh, and he doesn't have anything to back it up. You know? So he doesn't have any reserves to say, like, believe me, because each Petro is worth a jug of juice. Well, he doesn't have any jugs of juices because they all ran out. So it's, you can create as many currencies as you want, but unless people believe in them, it, uh, they, they're worthless. And, uh, but it should have it should have been like a scarce, like a, like a, a fixed amount of of the, of the currency. It should be yeah yeah, but it, it should be it should be backed by something, uh, sh and uh, people should believe you. So they think like you are a guy who's capable of running a currency. Like, sir, what's your name? Aviv. 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 So people say like Aviv, he's a smart guy. He has run many currencies before. I think he can do a good job with this new currency. But if you're Maduro and you manage to destroy an oil country, the first ever hyperinflation in an oil exporter in the history of the world, if you don't, if you, yeah, if you don't count Russia in the 90s for special circumstances, I mean, you're not very good at running currency, so we're not going to believe you, you know? So, uh, like my question was, like, is it a fixed amount? Is, like, do you know if it's a fixed amount of... Uh, like no one really knows. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a currency that doesn't make sense. There's no... Uh, there's so many different rules about it that don't make any... It's a cryptocurrency, but there's no code, you know? Uh, uh, so it's not real cryptocurrency, right? Uh, when it's, it's backed by oil, but the oil is in the ground. Well, you, you can't say that my currency is going to be based by solar energy just because the sun shines. You know, you got to... You gotta be able to, you know, get it out, you know, of the sun. Or in this case, get it out of you. You can't just say like whatever's under here is is the reserve. So it's it's worthless. Yeah. You uh, you need to make a credible statement. And um, what about the UN? Uh, and also, I think about they invaded Iraq. They took the oil. Nobody, I don't know, thinks about it in Venezuela. When you mentioned Trump, not invasion, but still, like they can have a lot of profit by doing so. Only 20% remain in the country. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, like the, the UN, I think that's what you began with. I mean, that's never going to happen. The UN is just too divided. Uh, you, Russia and China continue, well, Russia continues to support Venezuela. It's, it's, a, it's another conversation, but basically they want, uh, it's, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, they, they, they want like another, uh, it's, it's another conflict against, it's part of the US. It's having like another, uh, basically, uh, uh, an, another base and another way to stick it to the US and create problems for them. So it's, it's like this big kind of chess game. And uh, Russia will vote, well, it has been voting down every resolution in the UN against Venezuela. In the region that you, you gradually begin to see kind of a, it's not quite a coalition yet, but some governments like Colombian who would say like, military force is completely unthinkable in Venezuela now are no longer ruling it out completely. They say, like, we'll, we'll think about it, which is, again, like, you know, to think of an... In there hasn't been a war in South America between nations, I mean, including, like, some border kind of uh, skirmishes that don't really count, not since 30s when Bolivia and Paraguay fought the wars. And now to think of it, it's still far away. It's still very far away. It's very... It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a region that's used to wars. It's not, these are not people that are used to wars. It's, it's, so it's going to take a long, a long time to, to come to that, but uh, but yeah, it's always kind of there's no, it's gradually moving in that direction, and there's no alternative, as as I have been saying. I have two questions. First, like all the legal are known for their who? Sorry. All the legal are known to their parents. So there is a try to do something else, like they're thinking about something, they're asking economists, they are the one. There is a try. It's a, it's a good question. When when Chavez died and Maduro came to power. 
a lot of people thinking he's not Maduro is not crazy. You know, he's gonna liberalize things a bit. You know, things are not really working. It's all based on oil. It can, can go down any time, and he'll do things a bit differently. You know, he'll try to reform. You know, kind of not quite like China, but you can kind of imagine. You know, sort of keeping the political system while making the economy more flexible. Uh, a bit more liberal, uh, and there were voices in the government at the time uh, who were advocating for for that path. So make make it a you know relax price control, relax currency controls. Maduro um, Maduro turned away from that. It's it's a, it's kind of complex. It had to do mostly with uh, internal dynami dynamics of Maduro's government, so basically factions. So so he. I mean, uh, he, uh, the people who were advocating reforms were his competitors. Chavez died, so there's a lot of people basically trying to take his place. Maduro was, uh, he, he won, but there were a lot of people who also wanted his job. And he basically destroyed the reformers, uh, reformers uh, to st keep in power, but that left him uh, prisoner of the hardliners who wanted to things to just be even more controlled, even more socialist, even more, uh, even more uh, based on the states. Uh, and then uh, fast forward 2018, when they realized like this is like a disaster, we can't carry on like that, and they tried to do some limited reforms with currency. You know, uh, they tried to create new currency, devalue, try to create a new ways of distributing um, the few dollars that are left. It no longer works because people no longer believe them. There's no more credibility to them to do the right thing. So every new reform they roll out, it just fizzles out because there's, there's no, there's a credibility issue. You know, no one, no one believes them anymore. So it's very, it's, it's like clashing at quicksand now. There's, not, no, there's, there's nothing they can do that will make people think that they will do the right thing. It's only going to happen under the new government. So uh, yeah, it's, in a, it's a dead end. Is it realistic for Venezuela? Uh, <laughs> oh, no, 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 he's next. No, they did so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's okay. But is it really, I know it's a bit uh, crazy, but isn't it realistic for Venezuela to ask for some country uh, to uh, take over it in uh, exchange of uh, a part of its income of oil and try to rehabilitate it? Well, that would make practical sense uh, for a government that, uh, you know, just last month, five countries in US, Canada, Colombia, a couple more, they, uh, they started a case against Maduro for crimes against humanity in the International um, Court of Justice. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if someone else comes in, if a government changes, someone takes over Venezuela, what's going to happen to Maduro and his whole team and all these generals I was talking about? They're all going to, we're going to be in jail for the rest of their life for crime against humanity, so they're not, they're not going anywhere. Uh, there's, uh, there's no exit, there's no credible exit plan for them. And even, um, even if someone comes to them and the next government says, so look, you guys can take your millions, like go to like an island, some island, you know, live out in your mansion, enjoy life, we won't touch you. That's fine, uh, but what happens when the government after that comes? And after that, after that? You know, like, uh, look, look, look at all these people, uh, look at all the allies of Maduro in South America. Uh, Lula of Brazil, who, uh, uh, you know, he had to resign and the guy right next to him said, we won't touch you, you know? Thanks for stepping down, we won't touch you. But then the next guy comes, I know you're going to jail. And he's now in jail. Cristina Kirchner in Argentina, same thing. Uh, there's already a, a criminal case against her. So there's, you know, then for dictators to step down, they need to believe that they'll be left alone uh, to enjoy their, their wealth. And there's no credible way you can do it these days. Uh, I mean, you, you know, in the 70s, when there was a lot of dictatorships pretty much the entire South America, these generals, they might have uh, left peacefully and lived in peace, but uh, now they're all going to jail. They're like 90 and they're being dragged out of their homes in Argentina, in, in Chile, you know, in Brazil. And so, you know, you look at them. If, you, if you're Maduro and you look at these guys being thrown in jail, like, why would I, why would I want to do that? Yeah. Uh, and did, did, did Maduro try to do any, I don't know, tax uh, change, um, changing the tax policy or any other economic change? Well, uh, will... yeah, on, on, on taxes, uh, in the economy, that has a million percent inflation, taxes are pretty uh, pointless. There's no real 
your currency is worthless. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter how much worthless piece of paper you collect, a lot or little, it makes no difference. It all, all it At first, when he saw that the oil price was getting down, he didn't try to rise the state income by other... No, no, I think there was no preparation for the lean days. There was no um, attempt to soften the blow of, of oil. It, it, it caught him by surprise. And it was also at the time of first wave of protest, 2014. Uh, so he had other things to worry about too. So, um, by, yeah, by the time they started to do some reforms, as I said, he was already too late. Uh, There's a black market with their currency or something that started in uh, crime, crimes and... Yeah, there's a black market of uh, everything. Uh, yeah, pretty much everything is on, on the black market, like uh, bread, anything from bread to car to plane tickets to dollars. Uh, Everything is... Well, how do they pay for them in the black market? What's the difference? Uh, you pay for them in, in dollars. Like you pay you for... say dollar costs like 1.5 million something. Well, if, it's be, if you need it, you pay it or, or you don't buy it. But that's the only way to I get it. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, keep on... <laughs> the, uh, as, uh, as more and more people leave, uh, we begin to send money unofficially uh, to their relatives, remittances. So if you have a... Remember I said in, at the end that uh, Venezuela attracted millions of uh, Europeans before? Well, if you're in Venezuela and you have like an uncle in Madrid, you know, and he sends you like 200 bucks a month, it's not a lot, but it's enough to survive. You know, you can I buy things. Think if you don't have a post, you don't have a bag, you don't have it, There's a system, yeah. Okay, uh, it, mm, you know, we don't want to get into too much uh, technicalities, basically, but all the black market transactions they just done for bank accounts, usually in Miami or pa Panama. So no, no dollars actually enter Venezuela. You just, you send me, uh, you give me something, like you give me like a, a Coca-Cola, uh, and, and I'll transfer you 30 from cents. 30 cents to your Bank of America, from my Bank of America in Miami. That's, that's how it works, basically. Um, was there ever in There's, there's a, uh, there is a debate of when was the last time something as bad as this happened. Uh, it's, it's, it's definitely the worst in modern history in Latin America. Uh, some say it's, it's like the biggest collapse in, in, in modern history. Uh, remember bef before, before maybe 20th centuries, the statistics are uh, either very poor or non-existent. So it's, it's, kind of, it's hard to measure when things got as bad as this. You know, maybe World War II in, in some countries. I mean, like maybe like a World War II in Serbia or something that like half a population was wiped out. You know, you know, you know um, it's, it's the only thing that comes to mind. I mean, it just, and to think, have to think that far back and have to think of such atrocious events, is, it just shows you that. Uh, yeah, well, it was, yeah, but it, 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 had, it had hyperinflation, uh, you're right, but it was only, Minnesota has a whole cocktail of, uh, basically, of, you know, collapsing economy, uh, uh, balance of payment crisis, hyperinflation, uh, you know, uh, immigration. Germany just had one, and and even and Germany didn't survive, you know, in, in that uh, in, in that. So, yeah. That's. So, for you personally. Were you able, in a not intimidated way, to get information or poor information? And what about the local media? What was happening with them? Yeah, it's it's a very it's a very tough place to report. Like the toughest place I've ever had to report in. Uh, it's extremely corrupt, so no one has any incentives to talk to you. There's no official information. The government stopped publishing any statistics in 2014, so there's no, there's no stats for you. There's, there's, not, there's no way for you to know what's going on beyond just talking to people and trying to form an opinion. Um, it's a very dangerous place to be. What I didn't mention, I suppose, this, this collapse has obviously, I think someone uh, implied to it in one of their questions, that this economic collapse has, has even ex has exasperated the problem of crime. Venezuela now has the second highest homicide rate in the world, in the world, after El Salvador. Uh, it's, uh, if, you, if you are, if you live in Venezuela and you live until the age of 72, you have one in ch 10 chance of being killed in that time. Think about it. Like, what? 
I mean, yeah, there's, there's crime, crime is a daily part of life. You know, like it's, it's uh, you can get killed for taking your phone out on the streets. Uh, you can get killed for the slightest things. But it, it's uh, it's not a question of me being a reporter. It's just a question of, for me being there. And of course, yeah, we had we had problems with with you know with. Uh, with being mugged on gun points, uh, with you know protests, of course, very dangerous uh, times. Uh, uh, the military is extremely aggressive, but it's it, you know if you live there, that's what you go for every day. Uh, I wouldn't say being a reporter made it more or less uh, dangerous uh, as it was for just an average person. But there's no, you have no protection being a journalist. You just you're just trying to survive like anyone else is. You know you might have access to dollars. Uh, so your lifestyle is gazillions times better than an average person, but as far as dealing with the dangers of everyday life, uh, you you you're in the same fix. You know, you just got to sink or swim. Really. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Yeah. But as a journalist, how does the government government treat you, and how do the people that protest against the government treat you? Because they, maybe they want you to treat yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you will tell about what's happening in Venezuela, the whole war. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's it's a, it's a funny it's a funny question actually. I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. You know, and then, um, uh, anyone here speaks Russian? I know Daniel does. Uh, is, you know, we have, we have a phrase that in Russia kind of translates. Uh, 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 one of us among strangers, and the stranger among your own. Uh, so it, it basically. In, you know, for the government, the supporters of the government, you are part of Western media, imperialist, you know, Yankee, uh, sort of lackey, uh, spy, uh, you know, saboteur. Uh, but when you go to, you know, protesters in the streets and to government protests, and, you know, they, there's always paranoia. So everyone's like, you know, always like looking for like, you know, defectors of government spies and they grab your badge and they see like you from Russia, which is a Ally, ally of a government, and like you are Putin spy, you know you are. Uh, so uh, yeah, yeah, it's um, it's the uh, it's uh, you know no one really likes you, and um, like in the, in American embassy, uh, they think you are a Russian spy, and in the Russian embassy, they think you are uh, an American spy. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, you know you can't you can't uh, you can't please everyone, um, but yeah, the the government is very hostile to all press because. Um, because uh, we basically stole millions of dollars and destroyed the country, you know. So there's uh, there's absolutely zero incentive for them to talk to you. All the people in the in the early Maduro days, I think you asked the, the same questions. The, the reformer wing, the people that tried to make things better, you could approach them, and you know you could have interviews with ministers. Uh, uh, you know, Maduro would hold press conference sometimes. He wouldn't answer questions, real, but um, um, you know, he would. Uh, he would, uh, so we, you know, they would call like an uh, international press conference, you know, international press, you know, interview Maduro at the presidential palace, and you would like sit in that presidential palace for like whole days in air conditioning, shivering, no toilet paper, no water, no nothing, and then he comes and they say, okay, so five questions, and they, we're gonna pick them from the, uh, from a raffle, and it's like. Oh, Prince Latina from Cuba. Oh, all right. Russia Today from Kremlin. You know, so it's like all the international press is not real international press, right? It's just his buddies from. So uh, maybe you would have like one real question between I'm on real press, so there's no um, there's no real way for you to. But but that's you know you. Um, it, it, it was hard to make sources. Uh, in the military or in the business or in the government because uh, the things were going done so fast that you know you might spend like a year trying to gain trust of someone and the next day he might be killed or he might be thrown in jail or he might be forced to leave a country uh, and all of a sudden he just disappears as a, as a source you know as a person even so uh, why bother trying to do that you know so it's, it's a lot of time for something that it's, it's very you, you're trying to grab on to piece information but things move uh, very fast you know uh, it's it's very it's very common you know you would you like call someone like you would know like a businessman and you would like I don't know he would be like I don't know maybe like a meat producer or something and you're doing a story about like meat and you like you call him up and like his phone doesn't work anymore like you google him and he's he's been thrown in jail for raising prices of meat or something, you know? Uh, because how do you fight inflation? You pretend there's no inflation. So the government for a long time, and one of the reasons there was no cash, because the government for a long time refused to print new notes with more, uh, with more zeros. So it's like, we, what, what inflation? There's no inflation, you know? We just, 100, 100 Bolivar is still the biggest uh, bill. Well, a dollar is like one and a half million Bolivar, so imagine how many little notes you would need just to buy coffee. 
but uh, the government thought that if it just doesn't print zeros, inflation disappears. Um, and it also it kept all the prices fixed, you know, so uh, inflation, according to them, couldn't rise. So if you are a meat producer and you're trying to make some money to survive to make more meat and you raise the prices, then you're thrown in jail as a uh, saboteur, economic saboteur, we called it. And then, of course, no one else is making any meat and, it doesn't, you know, prices just keep going up even faster. Um. Does Russia have a part in this? I mean, does she have an interest that the world uh, stays yeah, yeah, it, it does. Yeah, again, it's a it's, it's a complex topic. So someone referred to it before, but uh, yeah, to the U.S., it's uh, to, to to Russia, uh, it's um, supporting Maduro is is a way of creating another problem for the U.S. on its doorstep. So you know, not to get too deep in geopolitics, but if you, you know, uh, if you're going to uh, if you're going to create problems for us in Eastern Europe, look what we can do in your own doorstep, right? Because remember, America considers that everything in Western Hemisphere is its uh, exclusive zone of influence, backyard, exactly. Uh, so, so for them, propping up Maduro without investing too much money into him, without losing too much money, is, is, is a way of, is, is a bargaining chip that they can use against America in uh, getting concessions on Syria, on Ukraine, on sanctions, etc. Uh, that's, that's, why, that's why we keep supporting them, yeah. Uh, before, they were making a lot of money selling weapons to uh, Venezuela. Now, it's not really an issue because Venezuela doesn't have any money to pay for it, uh, but uh, it has a strategic value for the reasons I, I just described. Uh, new, new, we'll add a new person, yeah. Yes. So, from your point of view, what is the solution for that? What can they can do? Because they don't work, they don't have info, they don't have nothing, so how they can go out for this situation? Well, it's, yeah, I mean, the, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, the, the, the longer answer is that uh, as I mentioned a couple of times, you know, the Maduro's key to staying in power has been keeping the military on the side. So basically giving them out all the economic, uh, all the economic sectors. But uh, this only works with this. Given, uh, telling the military, look, here's the economic pie. You keep all of it. That only works if there's any pie to divide. When the pie is all eaten and it's shrank to zero, you no longer have any money to give. It's very small, but it's, it's something, and it's better than nothing, right? If you're a general, a jail or a bit of pie, you know, you choose a bit of, you choose a small pie. But it's basically, it's basically, you know, what the, the choice now. Uh, and if, if things continue the current trend, there's no indication why they won't. There's, there's, no, there's, there's no factor that could change with current trajectory, really. Uh, then Venezuela's... Um, Venezuela's... Uh, um, People making a... How do you say a song? Well, they tried. They've been killed. So now people have people that are ready to fight have left the country. But no, what's going to happen by June next year, if the current trend continues, is basically uh, Venezuela's oil. Uh, broadly speaking, it's a bit more complex than that. But for simplicity's sake, it's Venezuela's uh, oil export revenue will will get close to zero. So basically, it's, it's going to it, it's uh, it's. It's cost, it's kind of like running cost of a government, just paying like electricity bill at the palace, you know, buying some food, etc., will be less than the money that it earns from oil. So it's, it's going to basically, the pie is going to disappear. You're no longer going to have any spare income after paying the most basic, basic, basic things to, to pay the military. But at this phase, a theory it says that generals are going to say enough. We're going to basically get rid of Maduro. We're going to bring in the opposition. Now we don't get money anymore in non mean side of Maduro. That's the theory. Yeah, that's the only hope for the country, really, now. But eventually... Uh, by next by, But that's how, uh, yeah, I wouldn't set my... I wouldn't set your watch <laughs> according to it, but that's... Uh, if the current trend continues, by, by June, uh, the, the country will run out of money completely, completely, in the, even with the few uh, things that it has. Yeah, one last question. Uh, someone... Faster. Yeah, well, okay, well, you, you, you too, yeah, quick, we'll just do it. I have a personal question, uh -huh. because you started as an oil and gas analyst, and then you become a journalist, mm -hmm. and then Venezuela. So my question is, why, why Venezuela? Well, there's a, I, was, I was a young reporter, uh, you know, in Latin America. I, I worked, uh, I graduated in Britain in university, and then I worked for a bit, uh, as an, yeah, as an oil analyst in, in, in London, it was 2008. I just graduated at the 2008 financial crisis. It wasn't a great time to, 
to be a graduate, a uh, young graduate in London. Uh, you know, the job was pretty boring, it was pretty pointless. I'm, I'm, not, I'm from Russia, so my visa was tied to that job. And you just, you just live in like share some small flat with like five other random people living in like middle of nowhere, some crap hole in London. And so, you know, I don't want, why am I spending my best years doing this? So I grabbed one, um, my bicycle, I really like to cycle in one bag and I went to South America and I, and I started work there. And basically, long story short, I, I worked for many outlets prior to that, but uh, Venezuela at the time, it was the biggest story. It's basically the place where a young reporter could make a name for himself uh, because there's a lot of news. A uh, whole world is watching it because of oil, because of Chavez, because of just so many crazy things happening there and not many people who wanted to report it because, you know, if you have a family, you don't want to, you're not going to live there because, you know, you'll get killed. Um, so that's, that's where I went. That's where a lot of young, ambitious reporters came at, in that time, basically, because it was the, a lot of, a lot of demand for news and little supply of reporters, you know, and it's kind of a gap. I suppose any, any job, you know, you've got to look for that gap. Yeah. Do you think in the near future, any G5, G8 country is going to leave on Venezuela, you know, going in the future? And like, without asking any others, just thinking it's my responsibility, it's, it's the people's humans, like having the end, it's going to help them. I mean, can you think of any historical precedent where it worked? Or I don't know, maybe in Sudan, I think, maybe. Yeah, yeah, uh, but just, there hasn't been a precedent for that in South America, you know, in uh, South America, the idea of US intervention is still like very raw, you know, because there was so much, uh, bad memories of US basically when it didn't like something just invading it and doing something and things would just get worse than before. I mean, you know, Guatemala, Honduras, uh, Cuba, Nicaragua, you know, just list goes on and on. So it's for, uh, for South American politicians to accept that it, it's, it's actually the best choice to invade a country and try to sort it out, try to make it better, it's, it's um, psychologically really difficult. So it's, it's, it's hard to see it happening anytime soon, but as I think we talked with you, and particularly before, this is in the direction in which it's moving. Some countries, they, they, they don't support it yet, but they no longer are completely ruling it out. That's where it's moving. But it would have to come from inside Latin America. It, it's not gonna have G, it's not gonna be G8, so United Nations or whatever, it's gonna have to be, it's gonna have to be a regional effort led by the US. That's, hmm? For instance, well, you know, Brazil, Colombia, Argentina, you know, supported by the U.S., something like that, some, some sort of international coalition, but uh, it, coalitions of the willing don't always work out very well, as we've seen in, well, multiple cases, most recently maybe you know, Iraq, or, so it's, uh, it's, it, it looks like a situation without solution, really, for, for the short time being, and that's what makes it so, so difficult. Yeah. yeah, well, thanks very much for, for your time. Yeah.